Okay, so without further ado, I'm so pleased today to have my colleague and friend, Leslie Schifrin, who's a registered dietitian of the Valley Hospital to Par um, um, Valley Home Care, talk to us today about eating well with pre-diabetes. Thank you so much. And I'll say myself. Okay, you can just keep um, on. Good morning, everybody. I'm Leslie Schifrin. I'm registered dietitian and Certified Diabetes Care and ed Education Specialist. And I work for Valley Home Care. Am I being recorded? Uh, you are being recorded, okay. yes. Okay, no, just, sure. It's okay, you're good. You okay. can just keep okay. following your Okay, pal. I just wanna make sure this is very, you know, it's new. <laughs> um, I know there's a lot of you out there. Um, I just don't see myself on the screen. So I know that I'm on the camera. So I appreciate all of you registering. And I, I see some questions already, but we are going to hold off on the questions until after the presentation. So today is eating well with prediabetes. Like I said, I'm a registered dietitian and diabetes educator um, with Valley Home Care. I, we're a visiting nurse agency, part of the Valley Health System. And I visit patients at home for various reasons, not only diabetes, cardiac, we have an oncology hospice program, a pediatric program. We have patients from children to elderly. So I, I see the realm. Um, so today we're going to focus on eating well with prediabetes and welcome everybody. So I just, I know many of you probably attended the physician presentation on prediabetes. I'm just going to quickly review what prediabetes is and I, I'm going to focus on the nutrition aspect of prediabetes, managing prediabetes. So we know that the A1C is a very important a part of determining if you have di prediabetes. So we know that a normal range is less than 5.7%. Prediabetes range is 5.7 to 6.4 and greater than 6.5% is considered diabetes. I don't know. Um, I don't know why it's not advancing and she just left, so. Oh, here we go. Okay, I'm good. Um, what is prediabetes? Prediabetes basically is the blood sugar is higher than normal. There's insulin resistance. That's basically what prediabetes is. The pancreas, which is pro produces insulin, may not be producing enough insulin or the body cells are not responding well to insulin. So when we eat, especially foods containing carbohydrate, the body produces insulin. You need insulin to bring the sugar from the carbohydrate into the cells. So it is brought into the cells with insulin. So it's in the blood, but we don't want to keep all that sugar in the blood. So insulin will help bring that sugar into the cells so that we have the energy and the cells can work like a well-oiled machine. If there's excess sugar in the blood, then that means there's extra, extra levels, higher levels, or the blood glucose level is elevated. Um, sometimes it gets stored as calories or as fat if there's excess amount of sugar. Statistics, 96%, 96 million people of 18 or older have prediabetes. That's a lot. 38% of the U.S. population have prediabetes and they don't even know it. There are no symptoms. 65 years or older, 26.4 million have prediabetes in this population. So how do you know if you have prediabetes? Well, you would need to have a blood test, A1C and your fasting blood sugar levels, which we'll review. <clears throat> increased risk, what does it mean? Why is it so important to know if you have prediabetes? Well, it increases your risk of developing type two diabetes. This is a red flag warning. So that you need to address that, speak with your physician. Who is at risk? Know your risk factors, very important. 35 years or older, history of gestational diabetes. If you've had gestational diabetes with a pregnancy, it increases your risk 40 to 60% of developing prediabetes or diabetes. Very important after having gestational diabetes that the individual brings their blood sugar back to a normal range and maintains a healthy weight to prevent diabetes or prediabetes. Overweight or a BMI greater than 30 with one or more of the following risk factors. Less than three days of physical activity weekly. High blood pressure, a low HDL, which is the good, which is the good cholesterol 
or a high triglyceride level. A parent or sibling with diabetes, very important in the family history. You could have all the boxes checked that you're healthy, your weight is within normal range, you eat healthy, you exercise. Many times if there's a parent or sibling with diabetes, that increases your risk. So if you know you have a risk of diabetes, then it's important to really address the whole, the whole system. Exercise, eating healthy, maintaining desirable weight. Increased risk based on race and ethnicity. African-American, Latino, Native American, Asian American or Pacific Islander also increases risk. History of cardiac or heart disease. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. We see a lot of my patients in home care that have had open heart surgery or stents have history of diabetes. It does increase the risk. So we wanna be mindful of trying to reduce that risk of heart disease. So what is prediabetes or diabetes? What, are, what is the testing? A fasting blood glucose test, normal is less than 100. Prediabetes range is 100 to 125. Diabetes is anything above that 125, so 126 or, or, or above. Oral glucose tolerance tests, we don't see that too often, but these are the values. The A1C is really important as long, and in addition to the fasting blood glucose. Normal is less than that 6.7, 5.7, I'm sorry. Prediabetes is that 5.7 to 6.4, and diabetes is greater than 6.5%. How to delay or prevent type 2 diabetes. This is where we'll discuss the nutrition aspect. Changes to lifestyle. Eat a variety of foods, carb counting. We're going to discuss this in more detail. Maintain a healthy body weight for you. you know, don't necessarily look at the charts. What is a good weight for you, for your body frame? What do you feel good at? Achieve weight loss if necessary. For example, if you lose 7% of your body weight, if you're overweight, and add 150 minutes of exercise weekly, it can decrease your risk. So for a 200 pound individual, if they lose 7% of their body weight, approximately 15 pounds, the, there's a 58% decreased risk for the, those individuals under the age of 59. There's a 71% decreased risk for those 60 years or older. So there is an important impact in the weight loss. That helps that insulin resistance. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Engage in physical activity, be active at least 150 minutes weekly. So it doesn't mean that you have to exercise 30 minutes three times a week. It could be however you want to include that. That's the minimum. More is even better. So that will help decrease that insulin resistance. And a little bit more about insulin resistance. What that means is, yes, your bodies are producing insulin. So normally when we eat something like an apple, the body will produce, the pancreas will produce insulin, say, hey, you know, um, that apple is going to be converted to glucose or sugar. And I need to take that sugar into the cells where the cells need it. So the body responds, insulin is produced effectively in the normal individual. Well, maybe somebody that has prediabetes or diabetes, it's not working efficiently. So what happens is when that insulin is produced, the insulin hooks up with the glucose at the cell le cellular level. So it's like, a, think of it as a lock and key. And when that lock and key meet, everything works well. When that lock and key don't match, that's when there's insulin resistance. And we know that overweight, interferes with that lack of physical activity. So physical activity and overweight status are important factors in addition to the nutrition to focus on to unlock that resistance and allow the body to work well with the insulin and the glucose. So the better and it and it can be done. We've had individuals that are on medication that have you know, not needed the medication any longer because of their physical activity and the weight loss. Okay, what are the nutrition goals? Carbohydrate counting and the healthy plate. Control your carbohydrates. What are sources of carbohydrates? Everybody thinks that they need to eliminate carbohydrates to control blood sugar. That's not true. You want to maintain a healthy intake of carbs. 
Carbs are important for everybody. They're a source of energy. They contain B vitamins and high fiber carbs are a great source of fiber to help you with managing your lipids, the cholesterol levels, important for blood sugar control, helps reduce incidence of colon cancer. So carbohydrates have a lot of benefits, but we do know that excessive amounts of carbs in a lot of different forms can produce more glucose in the blood for those individuals that, that are insulin resistant and harder for that sugar to get out of the blood into the cells where it's needed. So what are our main sources of carbohydrate? Well, everybody knows starch. Bread, cereal, pasta, rice, potato, crackers, chips, pretzels. Those are basically your main group of carbohydrates. But milk and yogurt contain carbohydrates also, but a good carbohydrate. The carbohydrate that we see in milk and yogurt is lactose. So don't say that, oh, I can't drink milk because it has sugar in it. And if you look at a label, and we're going to be reading labels to show you that it says, oh, it has 12 grams of carbohydrate, 12 grams of sugar. It's not added sugar. It's the lactose sugar that's found naturally in milk, naturally in yogurt. The only time that, that carbohydrate content is going to be higher if it, there's sugar added, like a chocolate milk. Chocolate milk, can't have any chocolate milk without sugar added. So that will increase the carb content. But and milk and yogurt are important sources of calcium and vitamin D. So we don't want you to eliminate carb yogurts and milks because of the carb. Greek yogurt, for example, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, has a higher amount of protein and less carbohydrate. Fruit, um, huge you know, uh, question all the time. And I had this yesterday with a patient. Oh. I can't eat grapes because of the sugar. That's not true. I encourage all fruits, a variety of fruits, and it's natural sugar. Yes, if you eat a bowl of grapes and you're sent, you have insulin resistance, it's going to be harder for that blood sugar number to come back down to normal. But you can have 17 small grapes as a carbohydrate serving, a small fresh fruit. Just space it out. Don't have it all at one time. So don't eliminate any fruits. Don't eliminate your watermelon this summer or your summer fruits. They're perfectly okay. Um, bananas are fine. Maybe get a small banana or eat a half a banana. We'll talk about portions. Starchy vegetables, beans, lentils, those are also sources of carbohydrates. So your starchy vegetables are peas, corn, lima beans. Don't eliminate your corn from the summer. It's okay. Don't eat two or three ears of corn. One should be fine. And white potato, sweet potato, all acceptable. And of course, our main source of carbohydrate that everybody knows that probably you need to control for prediabetes and diabetes are sweet. So your donuts, your cookies, your, your candy, your cake, your pies, your pastries, they have the most amount of sugar, which is a carbohydrate. What are the goals? Everybody wants to know what the goals were. So for example, if you look at this slide, the general recommendation, and again, this is not for, the, for every population, but it's a guideline. 30 to 45 grams of carb we recommend for females per meal, okay? 45 to 60 grams of carb per meal for males. Now you may be saying, well, I don't even eat that many carbs and a meal I can do with less. That is fine. Um, you can certainly, whatever you're comfortable with is, but the bottom line is don't eliminate your carbs. You can control them. And we know that less carbs are better for managing blood sugar. So if you look at this carb counting handout and you can see the plate here, and you see that the um, half the plate is what? Vegetables and salad. And that's the lowest carb. There are non-starchy vegetables, your salad. So if you cut your plate in half, and I always you know, show this to my patients and it, visuals are wonderful, that if you can look at your plate, make an imaginary line down the plate, half the plate vegetables, salad, quarter of your plate be your starch. So that would be your pasta. Maybe go with you know, whole wheat pasta or brown rice. More fiber is better. Fiber helps to slow the spike in blood sugar. So anytime you can use 
high fiber foods, go for it. Whole grain breads, multi-grain breads, whole wheat breads, much better choices than white breads, white rolls, white crackers. And then the quarter of your plate would be your protein. So basically your carbohydrates are the foods that are converted to glucose. Proteins have ne negligible effect on blood sugar. Fats have negligible effect on blood sugar. They don't raise it. They don't decrease it. So protein is healthy, but we want healthy proteins. We want lean chicken, fish, lean meats. Uh, beans are sources of, of protein, but they also have carbohydrate. If you want to go more vegetarian, absolutely not an issue. Um, so that's something to consider. And you can see here um, showing you what are examples of 15 grams of carbohydrate. And you can check your label, you know, whenever there's a food label, you can Google it, you can use the app Calorie King. And if you just Google carbohydrate content of whatever, it'll come out, it'll come up. It's very easy. Like a slice of bread, regular whole wheat or whatever bread or a small roll is 15 grams of carb. A third of a cup of cooked rice or pasta is 15 grams of carb. Now, again, I'm not saying only have a third of a cup, which is a very small amount. So even if you had a full cup of rice or pasta, right, that's about 45 grams of carb. So just to put it in perspective, you know, how do you know how much you're eating? You may want to weigh and measure your food. I always feel it's a good practice so that you know what you're eating. And then after that, you can guesstimate. But what you think you're eating and what you're eating are usually two different amounts. Um, Six crackers, depending on the crackers. Again, read, read your labels. Fruit, a small fresh fruit generally is about 15 grams of carbohydrate. Um, a four ounce fruit cup in its own juice is usually like a peaches or an unsweetened applesauce, like a natural applesauce is usually 15 grams of carbohydrate. Four ounces of juice is 15 grams of carb. So apparently, you know, the way we um, have been taught and educate our patients that the carbs, should raise the blood sugar at the same rate. But everybody knows if they're testing the blood sugar, they may have some foods that will spike their blood sugar. That's very individual. And then you have your milk and yogurt. Milk, low-fat milk, fat-free milk, yogurt are great sources of calcium and vitamin D, and they're also sort sources of carbohydrate. Greek yogurt has been the best um, creation, I think, for diabetes and pre-diabetes. It's generally higher in protein and very low in carbs. So three quarters of a cup of a plain Greek yogurt. And Greek yogurt has a, a thicker consistency. It's um, taste, it, it almost tastes like a little bit like sour cream. And if you don't like it, I think if you tried it, it may just take a little bit of time to get used to. And only five grams of carbohydrate and can have up to 20 grams of protein, which is really great versus a regular yogurt, which may have about 12 grams of carb. There's also the yogurts have fruit added that have a sweetener in it, maybe stevia that decreases the carb con content. Um, and the reason why the protein is higher in Greek yogurt, it's due to the straining process. So it's a win-win. We're I'm always encouraging Greek yogurt um, versus the regular yogurts, if possible, if somebody likes that. Okay, um, again, um, half your plate, your vegetables, quarter of your protein, you know, quarter, quarter of your plate protein, you can always bump that up if you need more protein. Protein tends to be a satisfier for people. So you may want to bump it up um, a little bit. And these are, again, sources of protein. And then your carbohydrate, fruits, milk, or yogurt, healthy fats, avocado. I mean, you go into any store, any market, what's the first thing you see in the gross, in the produce section? Bins of avocados. Um, they're just so um, evident and popular and they're, they're inexpensive. And right now we want inexpensive. I know the cost of food has been unbelievable. And I see it in every store that I've gone into that they've decreased the portions and they've increased the price. So use the foods that are economically healthy. So it may take a little bit more research, but avocado is you get a, a good amount of value for the amount of nutrition and the money. Slice the avocado on, you know, a whole wheat toast with maybe a little cottage cheese, avocado toast, or egg whites with avocado. Um, 
you know, buy an avocado and let it, you know, use it for, for the week or buy a couple of them. Nuts, great source of protein, no carbohydrate. Seeds, also a good source of protein, no carbohydrate. Olive oil, canola oil, good sources of fat. So you want healthy fats and they won't affect the blood sugar. They won't increase it. What about our drinks? Um, we want to decrease, obviously, um, sugar sweetened beverages and we want more water. Alternatives to water if you're not a water drinker, sparkling water, plain or flavored seltzers, so many out there. Um, and then you can even infuse your water with lemon, lime, or cucumber. Try unsweetened iced tea instead of soda, which is laced with sugar, sweetened beverages, juices, and sports beverages all have a high amount of sugar. More healthy choices, increase your vegetables and salads. Eat fruit, yogurt in place of sweets. Eat less snack chips like the potato chips and the cheese doodles and all of those snacky type foods. Go with more of like popcorn for a snack. You know, three cups of popped popcorn is about 15 grams of carbohydrate. So again, you're getting a lot of volume, which is a little bit of fiber and less carbs. So that would be a healthy choice. Now, again, there's um, rice cakes, you know, rice cakes with some almond butter or peanut butter or any of the other nut butters. We have so much at our fingertips now that we never had before. So there's a lot of alternatives. And if you feel like you need some jelly on your peanut butter, go with an all fruit jam or a no sugar added if you prefer. So there's, like I said, there's a lot of choices out there. Just see, okay. Um, small steps to healthy habits. Reduce excess calories. We want to maintain desirable weight. Eat smaller food portions. Look at your portions. Can you limit them? Again, if you're overweight or you need to manage your weight, if your weight is within normal range, then continue doing what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. Share main course or take half home. Roast, bake, broil, grill, steam, stir fry or air fry. You know, now I've added air fry to my presentations and my counseling, because I think most people are using air fryers now. And, you know, it's, I was looking online, um, my mom needed to replace her toaster oven. I could hardly find a plain toaster oven. She said, oh, maybe I should get the air fryer. I'm like, eh, I don't think so. It might be too complicated, but now the toaster ovens come with air fryers built in and it's the easiest thing. I love it. I'll, I have the, um, Cuisinart um, toaster oven, which has the air fryer rack on it. And you just switch the dial and everything in there tastes better. Um, and so if you feel that you want that fried food taste, or you just want something to be a little bit more crisp, something to think about, you're not adding calories and you slice up a sweet potato into uh, fries, fries sizes, put them in the air fryer, little olive oil, garlic, and you feel like you're eating french fries. Try a plant-based protein containing meal, such as a variety of beans, lentils, veggie burgers. Eat fish twice a week. You can try even like um, zucchini uh, noodles. You can even do it yourself or you can buy them already pre-made in place of a pasta. And you feel like you can, you're enjoying your meatballs and maybe you don't wanna use the pasta, but you can use the zucchini noodles and add a little marinara and you've got your meal. I also try fish at least twice a week. Small steps. Choose lean sources of protein instead of high fat cold cuts, more chicken, more turkey. Avoid the bologna, salami, pastrami, corned beef, hot dogs, bacon, sausage. There's chicken sausage, there's turkey bacon, which are much less and much lower in fat. So we also want to look at your total fat, reduce your saturated fat, your cholesterol intake, more lean meats, lean foods. Track your progress. Use the apps. There's MyFitnessPal or whatever app, whichever app works best for you. We're in a world of apps for sure. <laughs> um, okay, what about sugar? I know you all probably want to know how much sugar should I be eating? Well, I have to say the new food label is really helping us in identifying sugar content of foods. And I think it'll help you also, but you just need to know 
what it all means. First of all, um, the American Heart Association has come out with recommendations for females and males. They are recommending no more than six teaspoons of sugar. And that we're talking about added sugar per day. So not only sugar, at, <laughs> at, you know, sugar that you would add to your tea or coffee, but we're talking about the added sugar that are in foods. And I'll, I'll describe to you how to figure that out. And it gives you the grams of carb or 100 calories per day. But really, um, I'll show you how to determine the teaspoons of sugar in food products. Males, no more than nine teaspoons of sugar per day for heart health and also good for the prediabetes. Just to give you a little insight as far as sugar content of various foods, a 12 ounce can of soda on the average has 10 teaspoons of sugar. An 18 and a half ounce tea, iced tea, 12 teaspoons of sugar. A 16 ounce energy drink, 14 teaspoons of sugar. A 16 ounce ice mocha, eight teaspoons of sugar. A 20 ounce sports drink, nine teaspoons of sugar. So you've had your allowance or more than your allowance if you have one of those. Most Americans though are becoming more mindful of sugar and are reducing the sugar intake. So that's a good thing. I know we really can't um, have you guess the carb content because I can't really, you know, um, well, we could, but I'll, I'll review it with you. Um, carb content of foods, guess the carb content. So we have a regular bagel shop bagel and we have a mini bagel. I have to say, I think that the mini um, shop, the bagel shop bagels have gotten a little bit smaller. Um, when we teach our diabetes, when we've taught our diabetes education class in the past, I always bring in, you know, um, I brought in bagels, I brought in mini bagels, I bring in the bagel shop bagel, the muffins, and show the individuals how much a bagel weighs, which can tell you how many grams of carb. So anyway, a bagel, like from a regular bagel shop, on the average has anywhere from 55 to 75 grams of carbohydrate. And that's about a five ounce. So a five ounce bagel is about 75 grams of carbohydrate. Now, there are a couple of ways to decrease the carb content of that bagel. Eat half, take the insides out, scoop it out. You definitely will decrease the carbs. A mini bagel, like a Thomas's mini bagel, has about, contains about 25 grams of carbohydrate. Okay, um, a muffin. They're very yummy, aren't they? But they have not only a lot of sugar in them, but they also have a lot of fat. So a large muffin can have about 38 grams of added sugar or nine and a half teaspoons of sugar. A mini muffin, about 13 grams of carbohydrate. Okay. So it's a big difference. A large apple, 25 grams. 25 to 30 grams of carbohydrate. A small apple has about 15 grams of carbohydrate. Remember, no added sugar. A cup of cooked pasta or spaghetti is approximately 45 grams of carbohydrate. And if you measure out a cup of cooked pasta, which would be like a side order in a restaurant, although maybe the side order now is less, um, is about a cup. So a cup cooked, I mean, it's a decent amount of, of pasta. And there's also whole grain pastas, there's veggie pastas that also will contain less carbohydrates. So again, there's a lot of alternatives. Okay, the labeling reading, key points. The new food label is great. Um, we're gonna look at the serving size, the serving per package, the total carbs and added sugar. So let's look at a label. So here's your label and the nutrition facts portion. So you're going to look at the serving size. So this particular item is, a, the serving size is two thirds of a cup. Disregard that 55 grams. That's just the weight of the product. It has nothing to do with carbohydrates. Also, what I recommend is disregard those percent daily values on the right. They, I, I'm just shocked that they included them in the new label. They're confusing. They mean nothing. All that refers to, and you'll see on the very bottom of your label, if you were to consume 2000 calories a day, this tells you that if you ate this one serving of this product, the eight grams of total fat is giving you 10% of your daily needs of fat. Okay, what does that mean? Forget it. Um, a lot of my patients get very confused. 
oh, I ate this, it only has 7% sodium. I don't want you looking at 7%. I want you to look at the milligrams of sodium. So we want you to look at the grams and the milligrams of products, not the percent va daily value. So you can look at it, but it's not really useful information. So I don't even spend time on it. Okay, what I want you to look at is the total carb. So if we see that this product is 37 grams of total carb, I don't know what the product is. It's two thirds of a cup. Within that total carb, there's some fiber, four grams of fiber, and total sugars are 12 grams. That's the natural sugar of whatever the product is and whatever the product has that's included. That's part of the total carb. We do educate our individuals to look at the total carb to figure out what the carb content is. Now, very important, you want to find out how many teaspoons of sugar are in this one serving of whatever this product is. So you're going to look at that bottom number it says includes 10 grams of added sugar. So this is important. You may want to write this down. If you divide that number by four, and so is four, it's going to provide you with how many teaspoons of sugar are in that product. So if we divide that by four, it's two and a half teaspoons of sugar of whatever this product is. So that's really, I find it to be really quite helpful. So your label, allow your label to be your friend. Check those labels, look at your serving size, look at your total carb, look at the added sugar. So obviously if you compared like a cornflakes and a frosted flakes, and you looked at the total carb and it's the same portion, right? The carbohydrate content of the frosted flakes is gonna be much higher because of the added sugar. And you're going to see the minimal amount of added sugar in the cornflakes and the higher number in the frosted flakes, just, you know, a point of reference. So again, I think it's been a win-win with the new food label. So what are the benefits of the new food label? It's calculating the teaspoons of sugar per serving. <clears throat> and again, includes 12 grams of added sugar. You divide that by four, three teaspoons of sugar per serving of whatever that particular food is. It's estimated now that the new food label can potentially prevent 1 million cases of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes over the next two decades. That's huge. Let's hope that that's really the case. I mean, we've been through a lot the last three and a half, three and a half years. Um, you know, people have been more sedentary because they've been working at home. They've been homebound because of, you know, the virus and COVID, you know, because of COVID. But I think that people are getting out. They're moving around, they're being more mindful, more helpful. So the good news is, is that consumers are now checking for added sugar content of foods and beverages. And they're thinking twice about selecting those foods with so much sugar. You know, when, when I educate our patients and I identify the, the sugar content of certain foods and the, they, they're totally shocked. They're like, oh, you know, when I bring that bagel into the classes. And when I show them how many grams of carbohydrate, they're like, oh, I'm never eating a bagel again, or I'll scoop it out. So again, it's just being aware, being mindful. Sources of sugar, what increases the sugar content of foods? And you think, you know, a relatively healthy food, why does it have, any, have how many, so many grams of added um, sugar? A lot of the, you know, health bars have a lot of added sugar. Why is that? It's disguised in different ways. We don't see really high fructose corn syrup anymore. It's not seen in many foods, rare. But sources of sugar that you may see in labels, and remember when you're reading a label, the first ingredient in the label is the largest in quantity. And then in descending order is the least in quantity, in weight. So honey, cane sugar, see that a lot. Maple syrup, coconut sugar, I've seen that a lot recently. Brown sugar, molasses, high fructose corn syrup, dextrose is a form of sugar. So if you see any of those items in a label, that's what's contributing to the higher carb and the higher sugar content. Top food sources of added sugar are breakfast cereal bars. 35% of our sugar comes from sweetened beverages and breakfast cereal bars. Too much added sugar can spike the blood sugar. And that's why we want to control the blood sugar. We don't want to increase the spike. It makes the pancreas have to work harder. Um, as we get older, the pancreas you know, slows down. 
So if we if we're spiking it, it's saying, oh, I need to produce more insulin. And then at some point that pancreas is going to get tired and say, I really can't keep up with this added sugar. And that's when the prediabetes and the diabetes develops. Um, also a little bit, you know, I'm sure the doctor covered all this. If you did attend the, the, the webinar for a couple of days ago, that if you have prediabetes, you are overweight, most likely they will prescribe like a metformin medication for you. Um, I know a lot of, I'm sure a lot of questions came from like Ozempic and the injectables and, you know, that's a whole nother issue, but let's try with nutrition first, if you can reduce your numbers and then, you know, speak with your physician if medication is needed. There's so many new medications uh, at the fingertips that if you can prevent using medication and try to eat healthy, exercise, lose weight, I think that's your best route. Bottom line, natural sugar from apple takes longer to digest because of the fiber. It's a slow increase in blood sugar versus drinking a glass of apple juice. Sugar in the soda, it's high. It's a high load for the body to produce. It's converted to calories more quickly. And the pancreas, again, has to work harder to process that sugar. Sugar sweetened beverages, we, we, um, we call them SSBs. One or more per day results in two times risk of obesity versus one per month. Obesity is increasing at a slower rate, which is a good news. What are some alternatives to sugar? If you feel you need that sweetener, well, stevia is more natural. It's um, plant-based. Monk fruit um, is also a natural um, sweetener and it's zero calories. Studies show that non-nutritive sweeteners, sugar substitutes do not promote weight gain. I know there's a lot of question about that. And those are your equal, your Splenda, you know, the pink packet, the sweet and low, yellow, the Splenda, the blue packet is the equal, it's bar tame. And they're, when we say non-nutritive, they mean they don't have any nutritional value. They're zero calories, zero sugar. They will not raise blood sugar. So they're added to like sweetened beverages, like diet soda, diet iced teas, sugar-free ice cream, sugar-free um, puddings, sugar-free jello, um, you'll see it also. So those are where you'll see those non-nutritious sweeteners. I did want to mention or discuss sugar alcohols. That's another non-nutritive sweetener, but it, a sweetener, I should say. They're sugar alcohols. They have a very small amount of carbohydrate and they used to sweeten foods such as like sugar-free cakes, sugar-free pies, sugar-free cookies. Um, you might see it in sugar-free ice cream. And they are like sorbitol, maltitol, xylitol, anything ending in an OL. Um, the problem with sugar alcohols is that some people are very sensitive to them and it can cause uh, gastric di um, distress. So like sugar-free hard candy, sugar-free chocolates also have them. And you may not feel the effects right away, but a few hours later, you might find that you have increased gas or bloating or even diarrhea. And it doesn't happen quickly. It could happen over several hours. So you think you're doing great with it. And then all of a sudden you're bloated and your stomach's upset. Why was that? But it doesn't happen or occur with everyone. Again, this is very individual. Um, Sugar alcohol containing foods are not carb free. I'm a huge believer in if you want that food with the sugar, like an oatmeal cookie, don't go with the sugar free cookies, which have carbohydrate any, anyway in them. And they're the sugar alcohols. Just look at your carbohydrate content of that product and include it in your daily intake. Don't, you know, consume excessive amounts, but certainly control the amount that you're eating. So sugar alcohols are not the end all, but something that I wanted you to be aware of. And I didn't want you to be blindsided and think that, oh, I can eat those sugar-free cookies, no problem. They don't have any calories. They don't have carbs. That's not true. What are best foods for you? These are some healthy choices. And this is through the American Diabetes Association, which is a wonderful um, resource. It's diabetes.org. They have great information about nutrition and health and diabetes and prediabetes. 
and best choices of starchy vegetables. Again, go with, you know, um, whole grain products and lean proteins. You can see here they're listed and best choices of fat. You want monounsaturated fat. You want to avoid those trans fatty acids, you know, the partially hydrogenated vegetable shortenings, olive oils, canola oil, flax seeds, um, sunflower oil, safflower oil, oil-based salad dressings, oil and vinegar. One of your best choices for salad dressings. Omega-3 fatty acids are great for heart health. And they are all your fishes, your fatty fish, your salmon, your mackerel, your trout, <clears throat> olive oil. Again, these are great walnuts, great sources of omega-3. And nuts are a great snack food. They're satisfying because of the fat content, but they're healthy fats <laughs> and the protein. So, you know, I, when I'm traveling, you know, I'm going from house to house to house. I'm out all day. So I have my little snacks in the car and I, I buy my packets of um, nuts at Trader Joe's. I get those, the bag of the almonds or, you know, they have the individual packets of the almonds. So if you're looking again for controlling the amount that you're eating for calories, it's a good way to start. And I eat a few of those almonds when I'm hungry and it, it just satisfies me, it takes the edge off. Um, avoid the regular sodas, you know, the fruit punches, the sports drinks, the sweetened teas, the, you know, lattes and the um, frappes and all those yummy looking um, drinks from Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts and wherever, wherever else you go. Come, cut back on processed meats and fatty meats like hot dogs and luncheon meats. We talked about that. There's always alternatives. And making healthy food choices, um, you know, vegetables, plenty of vegetables, lots of vegetables out there, your fruits and fresh fruits are always best. Fat-free milk, always good. Um, the yogurts, unflavored yogurt or the light yogurts are good choices. And grains, whole grains or multigrains, you can use quinoa, any of the other grains, bulgur. You know, there's so many different um, grains out there. And legumes, big proponent of beans, lentils, legumes. Also, if you have a problem with digesting beans and legumes and, and um, lentils, you can take beano and it decreases. It's over the counter. It's just a small tablet. You can take that before you eat it, and it does help to digest those gas-producing foods. Veggie burgers, also a great source of protein, and they're, they're meatless, vegetarian, <coughs> and some healthy snacks. Best foods for you would be, again, they're listed here. Um, we talked about popcorn and rice cakes and you know, showing you what five grams of carbohydrate is, three quarters of a cup of light popcorn, 10 goldfish crackers, um, one cup of raw vegetables, a, a hard boiled egg, that's mostly protein, a string cheese, a frozen sugar-free ice pop, or, um, a, you know, sugar-free jello up to you if you want to use that. How about 15 to 20 grams of carb? One small piece of fresh fruit, a six ounce light yogurt, um, Again, you can go with a Greek yogurt, which has less carbohydrate, whole wheat crackers, six of them, some hummus with some raw vegetables, or maybe some crackers, some uh, cheese quesadilla, you know, one cheese quesadilla with some salsa, um, half of a sandwich, some fruit and nut mix, um, some alternatives. So you, you can see that there's a lot of choices, three, three cups of the popcorn. So there's a lot of alternatives out there. So summary, um, I think we have enough time for questions. You can delay or prevent diabetes and prediabetes. Be mindful of your nutrition, your weight, your physical activity, and your food choices. And thank you very, very much. You've been a great audience, although I don't see you or I don't hear you, <laughs> but I thank you. I know there's a lot of you out there and I do appreciate you attending and taking the time. Oh, well, thank you so much, Leslie. What amazing information. And it is a lot, and I think it can be very daunting, but 
you know, really, once you get into habits, I think it really makes a big difference. Yeah, you know, I know it does for Absolutely. me, just to be aware. So yeah, we have too. a few questions. So, um, okay. So Joe has a question. A lot of foods I thought were good for me turned out to be bad. Why do you say that? <laughs> Cantaloupe, bananas, corn, anything that calls itself juice. What is your take on strawberries? I don't think they're bad. Again, I think that after this presentation that you'll understand that you can have your cantaloupe and your bananas and your corn moderation. Um, strawberries are wonderful. They're great antioxidant. They have vitamin C. Eat your strawberries. You know that a cup and a half of strawberries is about 15 grams of carbohydrate, or I should say a cup and a quarter, 15 grams of carbohydrate. And you put whole strawberries in a cup and a quarter. That's a lot of strawberries. Are peaches okay? Eat your peaches now. They've been wonderful this summer. They've really been terrific. Eat your peaches. Um, fill out the survey at the end. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you could fill out the survey, that'll be great. Okay. Look, we're going through all the questions right now. Okay. Um, oh, how do we get Medicare to pay for pre-diabetes coverage? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, they haven't. They will pay for diabetes, I mean, for, I don't know if that means for nutrition counseling, mm -hmm. they will pay for nutrition counseling for diabetes, but um, I'm not sure what the question is, if it's nutrition related, but they don't pay for it because I, I was the coordinator of our outpatient diabetes program for 21 years and they haven't changed that yet. Um, no, I'm sorry about that. Can you explain the difference between keto and diabetes diet? Okay. So Keto. And the other thing is we try not to use um, um, the word diet anymore mm -hmm. because a lot of people think that diet is a negative. You know, in the past, what does diet mean? It means no, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. So again, uh, we always focus on what you can eat versus what you can't eat. And that's how we approach our counseling because it's very negative and there's really nothing, you know, try not to be negative about it. Um, so um, keto is mostly very, very low carb to no carb. So keto means your body's in ketosis. So you're burning fat for energy. So you're losing a lot of fluid and you're losing a lot of, um, fat, but it's quick, but you have to be careful because when you re reintroduce carbs, you can regain the weight. So the best is to lower your carbs, but don't go, don't go completely carb free. So I can see it. When I, okay, Eileen has a lot of questions. Um, when I had gestational diabetes 33 years ago, I was on a diabetes diet that suggests I have three meals and two snacks a day. I was told by a nutritionist that they now recommend three meals that have enough protein. Why the change? There isn't really a change. It's whatever you're comfortable with. There isn't any set, you know, diet, you know, per se, or nutrition therapy eat healthy. Um, I'm a big proponent of not having long delays between meals so that you don't have actually a drop in your blood sugar and your body needs that fuel, you know, during the day. Like I can't, you know, during my work day, I can't not have my little snack in the afternoon or a mid-morning snack in my car because I feel it. I need something. So for, there isn't really a right or wrong way to do it. It's whatever you're comfortable with. I wouldn't go more than, you know, three to four hours without eating. So if you feel you don't need snacks, that's fine, but it's changed. You know, it's just about eating healthy and controlling your carbs. Eileen, do you suggest that people that have prediabetes get blood tests done more often three or four times a year? I would speak with your physician because um, an important um, point with the hemoglobin A1C um, which I didn't want to go into too much detail because I know the, the physician spoke about it and I'm sure the physician covered all of that, right? A couple of days ago, oh, yeah. talked about the A1C. Yeah. It's a three month average of your blood sugar. So probably if your physician is monitoring you for prediabetes, you want to speak to your physician and say, hey, you know, how often should I have my, my A1C tested? No less than, you, know, you don't want to go less than three months because it's a three month average of your blood sugar. So you probably minimum of twice a year, maybe even three times a year. So definitely speak with your physician, depends on what your value is. How do you feel about stevia? I feel that stevia is one of the more natural, um, more natural um, non-nutritive sweeteners. It's plant-based. I think that's 
a little bit better. Remember, these sweeteners about, they're like 150 to 300 times sweeter than sugar. So the amount that you need is much less than sugar. And um, I think it's fine. You know, um, I, I, I'd be comfortable with it. And if you look on a product that's sweetened with like NutraSweet or what, which is equal, you know, something recently came out with equal about the risk with cancer, the amount that they use in these products to sweeten them is minimal. So if you look on your label of like a light yogurt and they add stevia to it, let's say, and you look at the, or sucralose, which is um, Splenda, and you look at where it is on the ingredient list, it's usually middle to the end. So that means there's minimal amount. Okay, is coffee or tea once a day good without sugar? Is coffee or tea once, once okay. a day good without, sure, that's fine. Um, Audrey, I would be happy to eat vegetable-based proteins, but I know that isolated soy is bad for you. Ice, impossible burgers, morning side farm products, et cetera. Any recommendations? Um, again, there's a lot of questions with the soy because of increased risk for breast cancer. They're saying it's safe. Um, you know, that's total your preference, but you can you can also use beans, lentils, chickpeas, you know, there's so many beans out there. So that would be, you know, um, the Impossible Burgers, the Morning Stone products, you know, they're fine. You can use them, check the sodium content. Some of them might be a little high, but other than that, that would be an alternative. Veggie burgers are great. Dr. Prager has some good ones. Are Granny Smith apples okay? They're fine. Um, is the 25 grams of sugar per day for women for normal or pre-diabetes? I think it's for everybody. Yes. Quest protein bars have low sugar. Great. Thank you. Um, they probably have some type of non-nutritive sweetener in them, I believe. I've heard berries are especially good. Yes, berries are great because they're antioxidants, but all fruits are good. Yeah, four berries. They've been great. Is there some situations in which flaxseed will lower testosterone? That's a good question, but I don't have the answer. I would speak with your physician. Do you re recommend a cheese quesadilla? Sure, but I would go with a low-fat cheese <laughs> if possible. Just because cheeses can be high saturated fat and cholesterol. Are supplements for weight loss appetizer supplements like Bolo safe? I don't recommend them. And if you're going to consider them, you need to speak with your physician. Really try to reduce your portions, increase your physical activity. You want to burn up those extra calories. Um, yes, for nutrition counseling, I'm not sure. If they're ask, asking about nutrition counseling, we can give, I can put in the chat a couple of oh, yeah. ideas. So there's recipe for life, which is um, at the lockout. You need a prescription from your physician. You can schedule that. Um, actually, Sue and I were talking um, before the class about the, Di the Valley's Center for Diabetes Management. Um, just to give you a little background, for 21 years, Valley Home Care had an outpatient diabetes program that I coordinated. We had 20 classes a year, um, but the, the Valley Health System opened up a diabetes center, which sort of um, we decided we didn't need two systems. So they have the center. From what I understand, um, they, I know they have a nutritionist there, Kristen. I don't know if they have a nurse. They did. I don't know if they hired someone. So if you want the nutrition piece of it, um, it's available. Just go on the Valley Health web website and um, look for the Center for Diabetes Management. And, and I also have, that. I can also um, send you all uh, Recipe for Life and Center That's for good. Diabetes uh, numbers. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tapina suggested to avoid cereal. Don't like oatmeal, won't eat an egg every day. What are my breakfast options? Also, don't like the color or texture of avocados, so I don't eat them. Well, that's personal preference. Not everybody likes avocados. Um, I think that it's a blanket statement when you say avoid cereal, because cereals tend to have high sugar depending on them. I think that a lower sugar containing cereals, oats, fresh oats don't have sugar if it's plain oatmeal. And you don't like oatmeal, so, and you don't want to eat an egg every day, you can try egg whites, you can try um, maybe a Greek yogurt with some fruit, that's an alternative. Intermittent fasting, safe if you're trying to prevent diabetes. I think intermittent fasting in a 
you know, safe way is okay. But again, I would speak with your physician. What are the best high fiber foods for pre-diabetes? Multigrain products, whole wheat products, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, salads, and your grains are your high fiber. Again, it decreases the spike in the blood sugar. Where can we obtain the charts of food choices you used in your presentation? Um, I would go on to diabetes.org. Thank you so much for answering. You're welcome. Or if all fruits are good, why are apples, bananas not so good due to sugar content? That's not true. Apples and bananas are fine. They're good sources of alternate foods. Bananas have a high potassium content. They are good. It's okay. Don't worry about your fruits. Is it just removing the whey that makes Greek yogurt better? Um, no, it's the filtering process. It's higher protein. How much sugar is in a glass of wine? It doesn't have added sugar. It has carbohydrate, but they're usually, um, you know, minimal. Again, have your wine in moderation, as long as it doesn't conflict with any of your medications. And always check with your physician if you're on medication, if you can drink alcohol. I'm not, I'm not pushing you to drink alcohol, but everything in moderation. Um, thank you, Susan. <laughs> Okay, great. I think that's everything. That oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, why is brown rice getting a bad rap? I'm not sure what, I don't know. Yeah. I'd have to look that up. I don't think it's getting a bad brown rap. You know rap. that, so. I haven't heard that, yeah. but there's brown rice, wild rice um, combos also. And I don't know. Thank you, Leslie. You're welcome. So much. Thank